Welcome back, everyone. So, we're finally here. The infamous 25th episode of the series. I know a lot of y'all were waiting in anticipation for us to finally get here. So, sorry to have kept you waiting for, uh two years <laughs> Whew, okay uh no point in dragging this out any longer so let's just jump right in so the episode starts off very differently from really any of the previous episodes i say that mostly because it begins in the past far before the events of the story we've been following thus far it plays out like a sort of montage the first memory we see is of the blinding light coming from the sun followed by some children kicking a football you know playing a game or uh, spitting game? Cause I see you flexing for old girl back there. Do your thing, little homie. <laughs> anyway, from there we see more children. Some drawn with chalk on the sidewalk, some playing with cards, some with toys, some looking mad, creepy, and suspicious, and some are just, uh, crying which honestly <laughs> these days i'm all too familiar with a crying child anyway from there we get some images of some sort of machinery followed by a couple of shots of stained glass a fence adorned with crosses a dome-shaped room of some kind and finally the last three images in this sequence are of a shadow being cast by a young ryuzaki followed by two final shots of the sky and i know i just threw a lot at you but that's just how the first 30 seconds of this episode play out and i have a few things to say about all of it so so firstly, this flashback sequence that we were just privy to was from the perspective of Rizaki. And I mean that literally, because pretty much all of the shots seem to be directly from his point of view. Now there doesn't seem to be any sort of defined order to all of it, except for maybe the first image, given the way it lingers longer than any of the other shots. And we'll actually come back to that a little later on. But anyway, I like the way they've presented this. There's no dialogue or anything, but we get a sense of what Ryuzaki's childhood was like. Like he's surrounded by other children but never really involved with them. Like we see him watching them play, but there's no shot of him kicking a ball or drawing with chalk or playing with toys. He's always on the outside looking in, kind of a, a loner, which fits with what we know about him as an adult. Furthermore, it seems as though religion might have been at least marginally prominent in his early life as well. What with the design of the fence and the shots of the stained glass, which are typically emblematic of a Judeo-Christian aesthetic. But yeah, to pick up where we left off, we transitioned from the erratic jumps and discordant background noises to absolute silence. <laughs> But the silence is relatively brief, as it's quickly followed by the sound of a And I want to take note of the bell, because it'll be something that is both mentioned and heard throughout this episode. So much, in fact, that they probably could have called this episode The Bells, or no, <laughs> never mind. That's a bit of a cursed episode title, isn't it? But anyway, as the bell sounds off, we get a glimpse of this building, which is actually the Elizabeth Tower, more commonly known as Big Ben, which immediately lets us know that we're in Britannia, or <laughs> sorry, wrong anime, Britain, specifically somewhere in London. And if this is Rizaki's past, then that would make a lot of sense. I mean, remember when he said, at one time I was actually the British junior champion, which is actually kind of weird when you think about it because he followed that up by saying that that information wouldn't reveal anything about his true identity but like it was ridiculously easy to find a comprehensive list of boys tennis champions so i whatever don't think about it anyway back to the topic of this bell my first thought when i heard it was kind of jokingly never sent to know for whom the bell tolls it tolls for thee which is a quote from john dunn revolving around the notion of death and while the larger quote speaks to the idea of death in the societal sense, I thought that this excerpt from it coincides with what we're seeing here, at least tangently. Because, <sighs> okay, let's be clear about something from the jump. Rizaki is going to die. And I was debating on saying that this early in the episode, given I try to avoid spoilers, <laughs> for the most part, but I... <sighs> I don't really feel like this is actually a spoiler at this point in the story. Like, there is actually, factually, really truly no way out for Rizaki at this point. I mean, think about it. Both Misa and Light are cleared of suspicion, to the point where, according to the rules, it wouldn't have even been possible for either of them to be Kira, because if they were, they'd already be dead. Not only that, but Rim knows Elle's real name now, and she's already made it crystal clear that she's ready 
and willing to kill him for light. I will kill L for you. And even if she wasn't willing to kill him for light, she would definitely do it to save Mesa. If you do anything that results in this girl's death, I will kill you. So regardless of what Ryuzaki does, he will die. Like even if he were to call it quits and say he's giving up on pursuing Kida, Light would still have Rem kill him on principle alone. So yeah, he's dead. There's just no way around it at this point. But the thing is, with the audience well aware of the situation, with us pretty much knowing that this is how it has to play out, it gives this episode the ability to do something kind of special, in the sense that it allows us the opportunity to see how he contends with his own impending death. Because it's not just us that's keenly aware of what's going on, Ryuzaki can sense it too, and there'll be evidence that speaks to that throughout this episode, but we'll dive deeper into that a little later on. But anyway, as the bell continues to sound off in the background, we turn our attention to Watari, who's standing with a young Ryuzaki. Something worth noting is that while we do see Watari's face, we never see Ryuzaki's. However, we do get this moment where we see Ryuzaki looking up at Watari, and I really like this moment, especially the added touch of him squeezing Watari's hand while looking up at him, kind of speaking to the bond that these two share with each other. Ryuzaki is likely nervous about going inside this unfamiliar place, and he's holding onto Watari because he feels safe with him. And that would make sense. I mean, the building they're standing in front of is Whammy's house, an orphanage, and if this is the first time Ryuzaki is coming here, then that means that he most likely recently lost his parents, and Watari is now his new pseudo father figure. Like I joke about them being similar to Bruce Wayne and Alfred, but it is a legit comparison to be made. Anyway, aside from that, I just want to comment on how adorable Ryuzaki looks here. Like there's something about him all bundled up in a coat with the same exact hairstyle that he has now that just looks super cute. But anyway, the scene ends with a different angle of Whammy's house, likely from the perspective of Ryuzaki looking up at it. And this moment is distinctive in the sense that as the camera focuses on the building, it begins to kind of flicker, shifting in and out of focus like an old camera. And this idea of it being a camera is further implied by the fact that we can hear what sounds like a vintage film projector reaching the end of its roll. Before it ultimately transitions to Ryuzaki's point of view again, but this time he's sitting at his computer. And I really, really like this transition because it immediately reminded me of this line from one of my favorite songs by Death Cab for Cutie, wherein they state that our memories depend on a faulty camera in our minds. And I feel like this kind of speaks to that concept in a really cool way. But yeah, essentially everything we've seen in this episode thus far has been Ryuzaki thinking back on his life. And I like the idea that most of his memories are a sort of chaotic blur. But the one thing he remembers vividly is that initial moment standing outside of Whammy's house, holding onto Watari's hand for reassurance. It's really awesome and really well done. But uh, also, apparently Ryuzaki doesn't need a mouse for his computer, which is uh, okay. So from there, we transition to Ryuzaki visiting Watari, all the while maintaining the running motif of seeing things from Ryuzaki's point of view. When he arrives, Watari asks what's wrong, but Ryuzaki just doesn't respond. Instead, he just stands there. Menacingly! No, really, more depressingly, but this whole sequence does play into the overall theme and title of this episode, which is a perfect segue into... Episode 25 silence. So the episode proper starts off with Rizaki examining the notebook and noticing that a small piece of it has been torn off. He then asks Rim whether or not a ripped piece of the notebook can still be used to kill someone, to which Rim says that she doesn't know. And just like with what we saw in the previous episode, she's not being forthcoming with anything. And despite Ryuzaki's efforts, he's never going to get her to crack. We then get this moment where Ryuzaki asks if Shinigamis love apples, which is a callback to the notes left by Light back in episodes 4 and 5. And Rim's response is interesting. Not necessarily. You see our internal organs have already degraded. We've evolved to a point where we do not require sustenance. And I would just love it if one of them like asked her to elaborate. <laughs> like she seems much more knowledgeable than Ryuk, and honestly, she speaks so eloquently that I imagine having her describe the aspects of life in the Shinigami realm would be fascinating. But alas, that's not what we're here for, or at least Ryuzaki isn't, because after getting this answer from Rim, he quickly shifts focus to light. You're finally free to leave headquarters on your own, but it seems like you never go out. And that's worth pointing out, because while I find this unofficial rule to be extremely inconsistent, it has been said that a Shinigami must stick with whoever owns the death note that they dropped. 
So, I mean, assuming that's still a thing, it would explain why Light hasn't left the headquarters. Because if he did, then that would mean that Rim would have to follow him. And that would look mighty suspicious if she ended up doing that. Like, I really wish they were more consistent with that, because sometimes they just have to follow them around, and other times they can just fuck off and do whatever they want. But whatever. Are you suggesting that I'll be a nuisance for staying here? No. And there's just so much going on in this little interaction. For starters, there seems to be a clear change in energy between the two of them. The way Light turns to him, coupled with the tone of his voice when he asks if he'll be a nuisance, it, it almost feels like a rhetorical question, in the sense that he knows what answer Riyazaki is going to give. Or better yet, what answer Riyazaki has to give. Because what can he say besides no? I mean, he was adamant about wanting Light on the team once he was cleared. Once I'm sure you aren't, Kira, I'd like nothing more than to have you work with me. So to say that he doesn't want him around now would just look weird, especially since Light played such a pivotal part in them narrowing in on the Yotsuba group. It would just look petty as hell. Granted, it would be the right thing to do, especially if Rim had no choice but to stay with Light, but none of them know about that and without that knowledge, it would just look really bad on Ryuzaki if he suggested that Light left. Now, on top of what Light says and how he says it, I also want to mention the slow introduction of semblance of dualism. How, just like in the previous episode, it creeps its way into the scene, adding an element of suspense or really horror to it. Especially seeing as it's accompanied with Rizaki looking over his shoulder at this distorted visage of Light's face through the glass stairs. It's almost monstrous, which I imagine is the point. I especially like this because this is how Ryuzaki sees Light, but in the previous episode, we got a glimpse of how Light sees himself, as this perfect golden being, like something out of Guardians of the Galaxy, which damn, I really do bring them up a lot, don't I? But regardless, it's an interesting juxtaposition. And yeah, something else I think is really cool about this is the fact that Ryuzaki has his eyes looking over his shoulder, staring at light, but unbeknownst to him, the real danger is right in front of him. Also, just their placement in general is crazy. Like, Ryuzaki is smack dab in the middle of his two biggest threats. But anyway, semblance of dualism carries on into the next scene, as we see Light and Misa have a quick conversation before she runs off to, uh, get in character, I guess. Right now, I'm in no position to continue punishing criminals. That's why I need you to punish them for me. So, a few things here. One, you might hear this and be like, what the hell is he thinking? Why is he making her go back to acting as Kida? But best believe Light knows what he's doing. Now, secondly, Mies is about to go on a bit of a killing spree. But it just dawned on me that up until this point, she really hasn't killed that many people. Like I was calling her a mass murderer, but she's only killed like what, seven people that we know of? Like, you have those two news anchors, the three cops, one of which was Ukita, and then the two criminals she killed prior to the broadcast to prove to Demigawa and the rest of the staff at Sakura TV that she was Kira. And while that might not seem super important, I think it actually kinda is. Because I've said it before, but Misa's not like Light. She didn't get the death note and think to herself, I will become the god of this new world. No, she got it and immediately used it so that she could find the real Kira. I believe in what Kira is doing. I want to meet him and talk to him. All she is is a Kira stan. Sure, she's grateful to him for all that he's done for her personally, and she believes that he's doing the right thing by killing bad people, but it's one thing to support something, and it's something else to actively participate in it. For example, you could support the death penalty, but that doesn't mean that you want to sign up to be the one to flip the switch on every single criminal that needs to be executed. But now, I mean, that's what she's essentially been tasked to do. And it seems like she's not all that fucking thrilled about the notion of doing it. And I mean, yeah, she's killed before, but not like this. And hell, the only reason she killed before was to get Kira's attention. I had to find some way to make Kira notice me. That's the only reason I sent all those videos to that TV station. She killed those two criminals to prove to Sakura TV that she was the real deal so that they would show the tapes. And then she killed those two news anchors to prove to Kira that she was the real deal so that he would hopefully try and find her. And as far as the cops are concerned, well, they just happened to show up and she couldn't risk them interrupting the broadcast, so she had to kill them. But after that, she doesn't actually kill anyone. Hell, she was more than happy to just fork over her death note because she never cared about it like that. Misa was never in this to kill people, and there'll actually be more evidence that speaks to that in future episodes, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Anyway, now it's time for, uh, the musical portion of this episode, and, uh, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and chop this bad boy up line by line. Careful what 
you do because god is watching your every move now on the surface this seems simple enough kind of a sinister version of that santa claus is coming to town song you know he's making the list he's checking it twice he's gonna find out who's naughty or nice kidda is coming to town like yep, yep. sorry don't mind me i i had started writing this around christmas time i was feeling a little festive but the point is you get what i'm trying to say now this could apply to the notion of kidda watching over the general public but it can also be applied to riyazaki specifically because as it stands light is currently a task force headquarters watching his every move but then i'd argue we could even go a little deeper with it and get a better understanding of how misa views herself because despite the fact that she's doing the work and acting as Kidda, she doesn't view herself as a god. I feel like what she's wearing alone speaks to that. She looks more like a maid than anything, just cleaning things up for God in his absence. Because to her, light is the true God. I imagine at best, she views herself as more of an emissary of God, carrying out his will, like uh, the right hand of God, or <laughs> perhaps like the writing hand of God. Cause she's like, Right? Oh, come on, that was a good one. No, I, I, whatever, moving on. Hold my hand in the dark street. Or if you do, I know that I'll be safe. Now, this one seems relatively straightforward as well, and I'd argue that it could be in reference to what happened to her with that stalker that Jealous killed. As if she's kind of inferring that Light could keep her safe from something like that happening in the future, by way of eradicating criminals the way he intends to do. But to be honest, I personally kind of like the idea of it being a reference to the original OP, especially since she's holding her hand out to Light during that part of the opening. But that's just my own personal headcanon. Even if I'm far away and alone, I can be sure that you'll find me there. This I know. Now, this could be in reference to the way Light came and saved her after she was taken by Ryuzaki. And when I think about it, the whole situation does have a vague sort of damsel in distress feel to it. Him putting himself in danger in order to rescue her from the big bad boogie L. Even if the only reason he really did it was to cover his own ass. But yeah. You draw me close for a while, so quiet you tell me everything. I would argue that this too is pretty literal. Him pulling her close and telling her that he wants her to help him create a new world by acting as Kira since he can't right now. I mean, like I said earlier, she's never acted as Kira in the same way Light has. To our knowledge, she's only ever killed a handful of people, and most of them weren't even actual criminals. So it would make sense that he would need to explain to her how she ought to conduct herself while acting as Kira, as not to make it obvious that it's her killing people. Because as you might recall, Ryuzaki almost immediately knew it was someone else acting as Kira after she carried out her plan in episode 11. There's a strong possibility that this Kira's a fake. No, we should think of him more as a second Kira. So, yeah. If I forget what you say, then you'd come to me and tell me again. Yes, you'd tell me once again. Now, in this instance, I would argue that she's talking about how Light set it up so that she would regain her memories by making sure that her death note was buried in the woods. Because that was pretty important. Had he not swapped notebooks, she would not have gotten her memory back. So I feel like there are actually two ways to interpret this. One is by looking at it as a direct continuation of the previous line about Light coming to her and helping her regain her memories. And while it was important for his plans, I think it ultimately served to, well, kind of break her a little, to the point where she's now questioning how she's supposed to carry on knowing everything that she's been through. Like, it's interesting because when I heard this, I found myself thinking about something Ryuk said back in episode 10 that I feel really applies to Misa in this episode, and really the series as a whole thus far. Normally humans who come into contact with the Shinigami have nothing but misfortune. And this just applies to Misa so well. It all started with Jealous saving her life, which sounds good, right? I mean, she didn't die. But all that did was start a chain reaction that led to her coming into possession of the Death Note, of her cutting her newfound years in half and becoming a killer just like the person who took her parents from her, of her then coming in contact with a man who only seeks 
to manipulate and use her, of her then being apprehended and tortured for this man, only to then be released and be manipulated into having her life again just so he can use her to kill more and more people in his name. Like, it's just, it's, oh, it's so fucking depressing in a way that's difficult to properly explain. But I feel like her expression here is doing a pretty damn good job of summing it up. For the first time ever, she has to just kind of sit in her shit and deal with the reality of her situation. To really soak in the fact that she's really fucked up her whole life by getting involved with not just Light, but Rim too. Because she wouldn't be in this situation had Rim not brought the notebook to her. Like, not only is she out here killing people, something we've already established that she wasn't all that interested in doing, but she doesn't even get the reward of having Light by her side. Because honestly, I imagine she'd be more than happy to continue doing this if it meant being able to do it with Light. Because then she wouldn't have to think about what acting as Kira has done to her as a person. It would be the perfect distraction. Like, if he was around, she wouldn't have to sit with these feelings because she'd be too busy sitting on his... Well, you get the picture. But yeah, that's one way of interpreting what she's saying. But I actually have another one to suggest too. Because you see, this portion of the song is especially unique in two different ways. One, it's the only portion of the song where Misa asks questions. Because every other line in the song is a statement. And two, where every other part of this song sees Misa walking through the streets, this portion has her on a rooftop. And that's important to point out because it actually connects to something at the end of the series. Like, to the point where the scenes look almost identical. And not just in location, but in regard to what she's wearing and even the time of day. Which makes me think that this scene and what she's saying here is meant to allude to what the future holds for her once she knows all about what transpired during the events of episode 37. Essentially, I think it's meant to kind of foreshadow that. And I know I'm being kind of vague, but we'll get to it eventually. But yeah, that's it for Misa's song. And uh, if you don't mind, I'd really actually like to hear y'all's thoughts on the song and whether or not you agree or disagree with me on any of my interpretations. Anyway, things pick back up sometime in the future with the chief barging in and saying, I heard criminals are being killed again. And yeah, it didn't take long for them to notice that criminals were being killed again. Hell, I imagine it probably didn't even take more than a day or two. But anyway, ideas start flying around about what could be going on, with questions pertaining to whether or not Higuchi was actually Kira, with speculation as to whether or not they're dealing with a new Kira and of accusations being made regarding who this new Kira might be, the last of which comes directly from Rizaki. These killings began as soon as Misa was free, didn't they? And, I mean, he's not wrong. It's almost painfully obvious that the killings began the moment Misa was freed. Even Rim's back there like, I can't believe this. It has to be Misa. But anyway, after Rizaki uh, not so subtly alludes to the possibility of Misa being responsible for these deaths, Light convincingly tells Rizaki to keep his girl's name out his fucking mouth by claiming she has nothing to do with this, adding, Think about it. This started as soon as Higuchi died. Uh, doesn't that, like, prove his point though? I mean, yes, it coincides with Higuchi's death, but the thing about that is that we know that there are two notebooks, right? I mean, I know Ryuzaki was trying to get Rim to confirm it, but it should be obvious that there are at least two notebooks out there. I mean, the second Kira all but confirmed that by way of sending in that response video back in episode 12. Kira, thank you for your reply. I really want to meet you. So since you know that two notebooks were active at one point in time, and since you have a record of everyone that Higuchi killed in the notebook you retrieved from him, then it should be obvious that this new Kira wasn't ever killing at the same time as Higuchi. In fact, you could probably surmise that this new Kira didn't kill anyone during the period where you had Misa under 24-hour observation. And now that you've let her go, the killings have started again. Like, honestly, the only person you should be looking at for this is Misa. Or, well, at least that would be the case if it weren't for that pesky rule. Thirteen days. That's the only problem. And honestly, that's a hell of an obstacle to get around. Because the only way to find out if that rule is actually legit would be to test the notebook and see if whoever wrote the name down dies 13 days after using it. Something else worth noting is the fact that Rizaki is still curious about the ripped portion of the notebook, as he thinks that being able to kill by using just a scrap would have been extremely beneficial to Kira, even referencing the situation back in episode 8 with Light and his uh, potato chips. But again, that thought process is ultimately stifled by the 13 day rule. It's honestly the perfect guard, because even with everything pointing to them being Kidda, they're just safe. <laughs> they just can't be touched. It's, 
damn, I, I gotta give it to Light. A single sentence changed the whole game for them. But anyway, Light decides to change the subject and poses a, <laughs> an interesting question. Even if we do manage to catch the person who's been writing names in the notebook, will we really be able to legally convict and punish them for mass homicide? And it is interesting because, I mean, could you convict them? I mean, I feel like you could definitely have a case if the person wrote specific causes of death, but what if a person just wrote down names? Like they just never specified any cause of death. I feel, and, and I could be wrong, I, I could definitely be wrong about this, but I feel like you would have a very hard time convicting someone for mass homicide if all they ever did was write down people's names. Especially in cases with other notebooks, because those wouldn't have the rules written in them like this one. Hell, Mises notebook doesn't even say that it's a death note. Instead, it has ARVC-5 written on the front. Which, fun fact, ARVC-5 is an abbreviation of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, 5, <laughs> which is a gene that can cause sudden heart attacks in people who inherit it. So. Yeah, but as I was saying, if the notebook doesn't have rules and doesn't clearly state that it's a death note, then I feel like the individual could just feign ignorance. Like, how the hell was I supposed to know that I was actually killing people? Another issue you would have is proving the notebook was what really killed all those people. Because, yeah, sure, every name written in the notebook would belong to a dead person, but how do you know the names weren't written after the fact? I mean, even Light was going to use that as an excuse. If my family ever saw the notebook, I could tell them I was keeping records of various criminals in preparation for becoming a detective. So all a person would really have to say is that they were keeping track of the criminals that they thought Kidda was killing. So, to me, the only surefire way of actually being able to convict someone outside of using it yourself, which I imagine a judge and jury would probably not be super cool with, would be by showing them proof that a Shinigami is attached to the notebook. Because then the person in question couldn't act like they didn't know what they were doing because the Shinigami would be proof that this thing is a death note. However, even that carries an issue because if you do have members of a jury touch it, then you'd have to tell them that there's a possibility that they could die if the notebook is ever destroyed. Which I don't know about y'all, but I would definitely not touch that thing. But yeah, my thing is, in order to convict someone, you need proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And I feel like a good enough lawyer could argue reasonable doubt in a situation like this. Like, to me, it's not really as simple as, you wrote the names, therefore you are guilty. But then I may be alone in that thinking, given the fact that Matsuda ends up saying, Of course we can convict them. Even if we don't plan on publicly acknowledging the notebook, the least we can do is execute the killer. And this kind of caught me off guard at first. But then I realized there's evidence that supports him saying something like this. Both in the past, I found myself thinking before that some people would be better off dead. And in the future. <laughs> But I don't know, something about him being all for a secret execution just feels kind of weird. Like even Aizawa says, It's not a very humane way to do things. So it's just kind of weird for Matsuda to be the one to suggest something like that. But then this is Japan, and as we've gone over in the past, around 80% of people in Japan support the death penalty. And we can see that reflected here as no one disagrees with him. Well, no one except for Rem, because as you might imagine, your girl is definitely not thrilled to hear that shit. What are you thinking like Yagami? She'll be caught and once that happens- <gasps> So that's what your plan is. So remember what I said about Rim back in episode 23, about how perceptive she is? Well, here's yet another instance of that on display, because she was able to see through Light's bullshit real quick. And to give even more credit to her, it's not even as if Light made it obvious or anything. I mean, he was actively standing up for Misa, telling Rizaki to back off when he even suggested the idea that Misa could be behind this. Hell, even him posing that question about whether or not a person could be convicted appeared to be in Misa's best interest as he seemed to be implying that they might not be able to do anything to Kida, even if they did catch him. So I think that this, again, goes to show that Rim is very perceptive when it comes to people's true intentions. So kudos to her for that. But anyway, as far as the plan that she's referring to, well, I'll let her explain. Like Yagami is certain that I will do anything to help Misa and save her life. And at this point, the only way for me to save Misa is to write Ryuzaki's real name in my notebook. And you might be thinking, well, didn't she say that she was already going to do that? And you're right. The clip from episode 14 that I showed earlier does have her stating that she'd kill him. She even tells Light, This will not kill me even if it ends up lengthening your life. So, what's the problem here? Well, intent. You see, something that I made fun of during that scene back then was actually super important in regard to establishing this moment here. Because before Rim promised to kill Ryuzaki, she straight up told Light, I do not like you. 
And while I thought that was kind of funny, it's also the reason why she could kill Ryuzaki then without it being a problem. She was only killing him because it would make Misa happy, not because it would, in any way, end up saving her life. And even if it did end up saving Light's life, well, that wouldn't have been her intention. But things have changed now. Now Ryuzaki knows about Misa. Now he has his eyes set on her. And if he discovers her acting as Kira again, he will kill her. So killing Ryuzaki now has different implications, and she's well aware of that. And if I kill Ryuzaki, it would mean that I deliberately lengthened Misa's life, and I will die as well. And I... I don't know if I'm projecting or not, because Rim's almost always pretty monotone with everything she says, but it just feels like there's this... this slight hint of sadness as she says this. Like, the look on her face, while not drastically different from what she normally looks like, it just looks, to me, like she's in disbelief that she's been put into this situation. That this random human has backed her into a corner, and that she now has to die in order to save the woman she loves. A woman who, honestly, cares about her as much as Light cares about Misa. Like, my goodness, everything about this episode is just so fucked up. Everybody's going through it. Or, well, uh, almost everyone. What are you gonna do, Ram? You may be a Shinigami, but you can't hide the fact that you care for Misa. Shut the fuck up, Light. Like, oh my god. Gosh, this man is like a walking plague, bro. Like, I just, I, oh my god, I, I, I actually might fucking hate this man right now. Like, in taking the time to really look at the other characters and the shit that they're going through, only for this guy to pop up and taunt her like that, and it's not even like she can fucking hear him. This is just for him. He's just so, I, ugh, he, he's gross. I, I, I think I'm gonna be sick. Come on, think about Misa's happiness. I just want to talk to him. I just want to talk to him. I just want to shoot him. <laughs> anyway, welcome back to how to use it or not. <laughs> okay. So things pick back up with light walking down a hallway. And something I never noticed before was that this scene will come into play during the final moments of this episode. So I'll hold off on talking about it until then. Now from there, we transition outside where we see light stepping out onto the roof where he finds Ryuzaki just standing in the rain, staring off into the distance. What were you doing standing out there by yourself? I like the touch of lowering the sound of Light's voice so that it's drowned out by the rain. Super inconsequential, but I just like the attention to detail there. Anyway, Ryuzaki notices Light and puts his hand up, acting like he can't hear him, which he may very well couldn't have heard him the first time, but as Light goes on to ask the same question again, this time louder, Ryuzaki smiles as he puts his hand up again to insinuate that he still can't hear him. And I like this because, to me, it kind of feels like Ryuzaki is just fucking with him a little bit. It's very childish, but Ryuzaki has admitted to being just that so it's not out of character or anything. Anyway, Light ventures out into the rain and asks Ryuzaki again what he's doing. And Ryuzaki responds by saying, I hear the bell. Now this is obviously alluding to the bell that we heard earlier in the episode when exploring Ryuzaki's past, except in this instance, we don't actually hear any bells ourselves. And neither does Light for that matter. I don't hear anything. Really? It's been ringing non-stop all day. I find it very distracting. So, a couple things about this. I found it interesting that we can't hear the bells this time around, because it kind of further speaks to the idea that the bells are something that only he can hear. Like, we heard it earlier because we were taking on his point of view, seeing the things that he saw, and also hearing the things that he heard. But right now, we're not seeing things from his point of view, and therefore, we're not privy to the sound of the bell. Now, in addition to that, the last part of what he said caught my attention because it kind of serves to recontextualize that opening sequence. Because he comments on how the bells are distracting, and the opening sequence actually supports what he's saying. Because remember how it ended? With the footage sort of flickering out of focus shortly after the bell first started going off? Almost like the sound of the bell had begun distracting him to the point where he couldn't focus on that anymore. It also serves to make the bell seem all the more ominous, given the fact that he's essentially saying that he can't block out the noise. The ominous nature of the bell becomes even more apparent when he follows it up with, I wonder if it's a church, maybe a wedding, or perhaps a... The way his voice trails off insinuates that the next thing he would have said would have been a funeral. And I actually really like the way they had his voice trail off before he said it, because it's like, like he's almost afraid that he'll speak it into existence if he says it out loud. But yeah, Light, continuing to feign ignorance as to what Ryuzaki is going through, tells him to stop acting so weird and come back inside. In response, Ryuzaki apologizes and says, I'm sorry, 
Nothing I say makes any sense anyway. If I were you, I wouldn't believe any of it. And this is kind of weird because it feels so out of character for him to say something like that. Like, I can't think of another instance wherein Riyuzaki has made a self-deprecating comment about himself. Anyway, Light goes on to sort of jokingly agree with him. You know, you're totally right. Honestly, most of the things you say sound like complete nonsense. There'd be no end to my troubles if I actually took you seriously all the time. I probably know that better than anyone. And to be fair, that didn't feel malicious or even mean-spirited or anything like that. It honestly sounds how me and my friends would talk to each other if one of us was feeling kind of down. Because, I mean, they both know that Ryuzaki is a genius and that pretty much everything he says, more often than not, is the opposite of nonsensical. So Light saying this here seems like mild teasing more than anything. However, <laughs> Ryuzaki's response, well, it doesn't feel nearly as playful. But I could say the same about you. And to be honest, he's right. I mean, let's break down what Light just said and flip it around. Honestly, most of the things you say sound like complete nonsense. So I could 100% see Ryuzaki thinking this about Light. Because, I mean, <laughs> Light's been all over the place, especially regarding the idea of himself being Kira. <laughs> you think I'm Kira? I could be Kira. I am not Kira! Like, from our point of view, this makes sense because it was all a part of Light's plan. But from Ryuzaki's point of view, I mean, one minute he's scoffing at the idea, the next he's admitting to possibly being Kidda, and not long after that he's yelling and screaming about how he's been set up. Not to mention all the other minor oddities concerning him. Like, for example, back in episode 17 when he said, I can't manipulate a woman's feelings like that. Even though Ryuzaki and the task force were well aware that he was dating at least two women and didn't tell them about each other. Like, you think that's not manipulation, my guy? Like, you're willing to lie in order to get your dick wet, but you won't lie to help us catch Kira. Make it make sense, my guy. But yeah, my point is, Ryuzaki would be more than justified in saying that about Light. There'd be no end to my troubles if I actually actually took you seriously all the time. And again, from Ryuzaki's point of view, that's also 100% something he could say to Light. If Ryuzaki took all the bullshit Light's told him at face value, then there really would be no end to his troubles, because it would just be lie after lie after lie. I probably know that better than anyone. And lastly, again, this would make a lot of sense coming from Ryuzaki. Hell, now more than ever, when we consider that everyone has pretty much moved on from looking at Light and Misa as suspects. At this point, Ryuzaki's the only one one who can still see through the facade. He understands better than anyone that the things Light says shouldn't be taken seriously, that he shouldn't be trusted because everything that comes out of his mouth is complete and utter bullshit. But yeah, I just thought it was worth pointing out that Ryuzaki was right when he said that he could, quite literally, say those same things about Light. But anyway, Light, uh, seemingly offended by Ryuzaki's comments, comes at him like, what do you mean by that? And Ryuzaki responds by saying, tell me Light. From the moment you were born, has there ever been a point where you've actually told the truth? And the moment is punctuated by silence. Complete silence. Even the rain in the background cuts out as the two just stand there, staring at each other. Ryuzaki's words just hanging in the air, heavy, kind of like a thundercloud. But the question itself is... Well, it's interesting. Because, I mean, it basically seems like Ryuzaki is saying that Light has just always been a liar. And if I'm being completely honest... I, I would disagree. Like, Ryuzaki's question is presented as this kind of big thing, especially with the accompanying moment of silence that follows, but I mean, we just spent the last several episodes with a version of Light that hasn't been corrupted by using the Death Note. And he was a pretty cool dude for the most part. He was honest, noble, kind. Matsuda's acting stupid again. Well, that is his specialty. Well, I didn't say he was perfect, but for the most part, he was normal, all things considered. But anyway, Light goes on to respond and gives what feels like a almost rehearsed answer. Something something, lying is bad, I try not to do it, sometimes you have to, Pobody's nerfed, which ultimately ends with him saying, I've always made a conscious effort to be careful not to tell a lie that could hurt others. That's my answer. And while most of what he says is bullshit, I did find that last line worth pointing out. That's my answer. He didn't say that what he just said was the truth, but that it's his answer to the question. It feels very pointed to add that at all. But then I can't say for certain whether he actually meant anything with that last line. And part of the reason I can't say for certain is because, well, I have no idea what he's thinking. 
him or Ryuzaki for that matter. Because this conversation and the one they'll have in the scene that follows is devoid of any kind of internal monologue. Which, when you think about it, it's kind of weird, given the fact that internal monologues are basically a staple of these kinds of verbal sparring sessions. Hell, they're a staple of the series as a whole. And yet, here, during what may just be their final conversation, the internal monologues are just gone. Replaced with, well, replaced with silence, actually. Which leaves it up to us to determine the meaning behind what they're saying, both with their words and their body language. For example, Riyasaki ends up responding with, I had a feeling you'd say something like that. And you can see that he has a sort of wry smile on his face, which I interpreted as him kind of smiling to himself at how ridiculously pragmatic and inoffensive Light's response was. How, despite the fact that Riyasaki asked him a pretty outlandish question, he still answered it with poise and polite professionalism, like he was responding to an interviewee during a job interview or something. I saw Ryuzaki smile as being both wry and sad, because it was him coming to the realization that, despite his goal of trying to get close to light in the hopes that he would reveal something, he now knows that it was sort of a fool's errand. And even in asking him that question now, he knew light would respond with his trademark pragmatism. However, just to kind of try and prove my point about interpretation, I went ahead and asked my wife to watch this portion of the episode, and her interpretation was, in fact, different, and honestly, uh, admittedly better than mine, in my opinion. See, her interpretation was that Rizaki asking him that question was another test. My wife had mentioned the fact that Rizaki had taken note of Light's change in personality before and after his incarceration. It's as if he's a different person now. She pointed out the fact that Light had very different reactions to Ryuzaki's more out-of-pocket comments before and after he was locked up. Like when Ryuzaki first told Light that he thought he was Kira, he scoffed at the idea. <laughs> You think I'm Kira? But after being released from his confinement, he straight up assaulted Ryuzaki for suggesting that he was Kira. And not just once, he got into two different brawls with this guy. She went on to say that after his release from imprisonment, anytime Ryuzaki said anything that was even remotely out of line, Light would respond with aggression. But before he was locked up, he was always calm, cool, and collected. Exactly like he was when responding to Ryuzaki right now. Because... I mean, l let's be clear, what Rizaki said was definitely out of pocket, and if this was the same light from a few days ago, he likely would have gone off on him. But he didn't. And that smile that I interpreted as being in relation to Ryuzaki acknowledging the futility of trying to get Light to give anything away through conversation might have, in fact, been Ryuzaki smiling in satisfaction at the fact that Light basically just confirmed to Ryuzaki that he's definitely Kira once again. Meaning he was right in suspecting him all along. And yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, I have to admit, I think that's actually a much better interpretation of the moment. My wife cooked on that one. But then, honestly, that's not too surprising. My lady's always laying it down, be it with fresh ideas like this one, or with the fresh ingredients she gets from today's sponsor, Hello <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just fucking with y'all again. This video is not sponsored by HelloFresh. But yeah, you've heard both of our interpretations of the moment, but I imagine there's still plenty of other ways to interpret this. So be sure to let me know what y'all think in the comment section. Anyway, from there, the two decide to get out of the rain and head back inside, and it's here that things get uh, a, a little weird. So once they get back inside and start drying off, we get this shot of Ryuzaki staring down at Light as he's drying his hair. Ryuzaki then goes down the stairs, stops at Light's feet, and proceeds to grab them so that he can dry them off. Which, for obvious reasons, catches Light off guard. <laughs> What are you doing? And fair, it's a little weird, and a little out of character for Ryuzaki to suddenly be doing this. It feels oddly intimate, which is particularly weird for Ryuzaki, who doesn't really engage in physical contact outside of the odd handshake here and there. And I guess that one time he grabbed Misa's ass. And so when he does this, Light tells him that he doesn't need to do all that. But Ryuzaki insists, claiming that he's also willing to give him a, a, a massage, which again, <laughs> weird and it doesn't even stop there because he then follows it up with it's the least i can do to atone for my sins and at this point if you're anything like me you're probably like what the fuck even is this conversation right now because atoning for one's sins is a very specific kind of reconciliation like i could see him saying that he wants to make things right with light since he accused him of being kidda and it now turns out that he's not kidda but saying that you want to atone for your sins that's weird even for ryuzaki it feels 
pointed. It feels as though he's trying to appeal, not necessarily to Light, but to Kira, to the god of the new world. So does that mean that Ryuzaki is acknowledging that Light is god? Is he hoping to gain Kira's favor in order to stave off his impending execution? Well, if you ask me, yeah, I think that's exactly what he's doing. And I don't say that to mean that he actually believes what he's saying right here. What I'm saying is, He's stalling. Like, after their rooftop conversation, I feel that Ryuzaki is now certain that Light is Kira once again. So if Light is Kira again, it stands to reason that Misa may very well be the second Kira again too, meaning it's likely her doing the killings right now. So given Ryuzaki knows that the second Kira can kill with just a face, and since she has seen his face repeatedly for months now, it stands to reason that she could write his name down at any moment. And the only reason she probably hasn't done that is because Light hasn't told her to yet. So, with no moves left to play just yet, Ryuzaki is trying to buy some fucking time. And if that means having to kiss this dude's ass and atone for his sins by rubbing some feet or old boy's back, then fuck it, why not? I don't even see it as a blight on Ryuzaki's character because it's not as though Light hasn't pulled the same shit in the past on Ryuzaki in an attempt to avoid suspicion. You have nothing but my respect and admiration. Safe to say that he's the world's best detective. We know El's never been wrong before. If anything, one could argue that in this moment, Ryuzaki is taking a page out of Light's playbook and is being deceitful in order to survive. Like, that makes perfect sense to me. But anyway, Ryuzaki proceeds to wipe off Judas's, or I mean, Light's feet. And if you're not familiar with what I'm referring to, it's a biblical reference because this scene of Ryuzaki and Light, when it's not being used as inspiration by your favorite yaoi artist, is often compared to Jesus and his disciple, Judas, who in the Bible, was the disciple who betrayed Jesus and who was ultimately responsible for his eventual crucifixion. The reason the comparison is made is because shortly before his death, Jesus washed the feet of each of his disciples, which included Judas. He did this knowing that Judas would eventually go on to betray him. That's a very truncated version of the story. There's a lot more to it. And if you're interested in learning more, might I recommend the Bible. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I'm not a big fan of that interpretation. I get the visual reference, sure, but I don't feel like it necessarily fits, narratively speaking. Like, at all, really. Especially considering what Ryuzaki intends to do in the scene that immediately follows this one. Anyway, in regard to the rest of this interaction, Ryuzaki goes ahead and wipes off Light's feet, at one point kind of hurting him a little bit, or at the very least making him feel uncomfortable. To which Ryuzaki says, Hey, you'll get used to it. Which, if we're going with the idea that he's appealing to him as Kira or, or God, then this is meant to imply that Light will eventually get used to people worshipping at his feet, be it literally or metaphorically. From there, we see Light taking note of the fact that Rizaki's hair is dripping water onto his ankle, and again, Rizaki apologizes. It's actually the third time he's apologized to Light in the last few minutes. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Wrong clip. But... Uh, what's interesting is that the water dripping on him causes Light to reach out with a towel so that he can dry Rizaki's hair. An act of kindness. It's an interesting moment because, again, we have no idea what they're thinking right now. I mean, I'm of the belief that this is all an act from Rizaki's perspective, specifically because of what happens in the next scene, but I honestly have no idea what Light must be thinking about all of this. Like, the look on his face seems sad. Does he regret what he's condemned Ryuzaki to? Maybe it's pity? I could see him perhaps pitying Ryuzaki right now, looking so beaten and broken. I imagine, in some way, that might honestly take some of the fun out of it for Light. It's one thing to take someone out when they're giving it their all, but it's something else to have them essentially give up at the very end. It just isn't quite as satisfying. But what is satisfying, for us anyway, are these gorgeous shots being bolstered by the theme Light Lights Up Light, which is an interesting title for this particular theme, but I dig it. Anyway, as this scene nears its end, Rizaki says, It'll be lonely, won't it? And I imagine, in this instance, he's referring to the fact that he may very well die soon. And again, I would argue that this is still part of him manipulating Light, telling him how lonely it'll be without him around to keep things spicy, hoping that this will buy him some time before Light ultimately makes his final move. He even closes it off by saying, You and I will be parting ways soon. And while that line could be alluding to his own death in the same way the previous one did, it could also be referring to the idea that perhaps Light will be the one that loses here. And if you're wondering how that could even be possible, well, Ryuzaki's had something in the words that'll be made clear right about... I understand. I'm on my way. Let's go, Light. It seems like it's all worked out. And yeah, 
The two end up making their way back to the main lobby where Matsuda informs us that Ryuzaki has apparently gotten approval from another country to use the notebook for an execution? Yeah, this is an interesting predicament because really, why would you need to test it out? I mean, y'all know that it works. There's no confusion about that. Not only did y'all see Higuchi use it, but you have a Shinigami right there that proves that this shit is not of this world. So if it's not to test if the notebook is real, then what exactly are you testing? And I figured one of them would like ask that, but they actually don't. So, I mean, to be clear, Ryuzaki's specific goal is to test out the 13 day rule. Because as it stands, that's the only thing in the way of proving that Light and Misa are still acting as Kira. Though, if I'm being honest, if he were to explain that to them, then they'd probably be even more against this. I say that because, look, we know he's right to do this because we're able to see the entire picture. But if I look at things from the task force's point of view, I, I, I don't know if I would back Ryuzaki's decision here. If for no other reason than his focus on Light and Misa makes it look like he's just fixated on them. Again, we, as the audience, know that he's right, but it does look pretty damning. Like you locked them up for almost two months, then you kept them under constant surveillance for another few months after that. And now that they've finally been cleared by this rule in the notebook that's been confirmed by the Shinigami that we have hanging out with us, you're still unwilling to just let it go. It's giving obsession, Ryuzaki. But anyway, Part of Matsuda's reservation is the fact that the 13 day rule exists at all. If someone starts writing in the notebook, they'll have to obey the 13 day rule and keep writing names forever. But since that's precisely what Ryuzaki is trying to determine, he's already factored that into his plan. And it's actually a really simple workaround. He's just gonna have an inmate scheduled to die in a little over 13 days, be the one to write down the name of another inmate scheduled to be executed sooner. I mean, they're both scheduled to be executed anyway, so what's the difference, right? It's actually pretty much the same thing he did back in episode too with Linda L. Taylor. And hell, if by chance the 13 day rule isn't real and the inmate who wrote the name doesn't die, then Ryuzaki has worked it out so that the inmate in question won't be executed at all. So this test has the potential to not only save someone's life if it turns out that the 13 day rule is fake, but you could also make it so that the inmate being killed by the notebook has a more humane execution than they otherwise would have. What I mean is whoever writes down the name could also include a specific cause of death, like I don't know, dying peacefully in their sleep at a specific time or something. Like I imagine that would be preferable for that inmate as opposed to getting shot up with a lethal cocktail or put in an electric chair. Like there really shouldn't be an issue here at all. But still. But still what, my guy? Like there's literally nothing wrong with this. The chief goes on to say that by doing this, they're sacrificing a life, but it's like, whose life are y'all sacrificing? It sounds like you have the potential to save lives by doing this. Because if it turns out that that rule is fake, it means that you now know exactly whose door to knock on to find this newest kidda. Like, what is this? Actually, I know exactly what it is. And it's a little annoying, but we'll talk about it in a second. Still, to sacrifice our We're life. very close. <sighs> so close, and yet so very far away. If we work this out, the entire case will be solved. And he's right, honestly. But unfortunately, well, it doesn't matter much at this point. <laughs> So that line from Rizaki is followed by a flash of lightning as the intro to the theme song Domine Kira revs up. We then get this shot of Rem looking more sinister and monstrous than we've ever seen before. She actually looks kind of terrifying, honestly. Like she looks like the type of creature that would feed off a human and steal their lifespan. And in this moment in particular, she looks like she'd do it with her bare hands if she had to. It's actually kind of hilarious that she could probably physically decimate these guys, but instead she's just gonna go run around and write these guys' names down. And if you're wondering why I said names, well, I know you're already prepared for Rizaki's death, but unfortunately he isn't the only one dying tonight because the first name that Rim goes off to write down is Watari. And yeah, this is how we say goodbye to Watari. It's kind of insane that we've actually known Watari since episode two. Hell, we were even technically introduced to him before Rizaki. But unfortunately, his journey ends here, as Rim made sure to write his name down first. Which, a couple things about this. 
one, what made her go after him first? Like, Light never mentioned Watari to her, and aside from maybe seeing him during the whole Higuchi incident in the previous episode, she probably hasn't had any sort of interaction with him whatsoever. Hell, I don't even know if Watari touched the notebook at all. I mean, if he didn't touch it in the helicopter, then I don't see any reason for him to do it after they get back to headquarters, since he isn't part of the investigation team like that. Plus, once they found out about that rule concerning those who touch the notebook being condemned to death if the notebook is destroyed, it would make sense to have at least one person not touch it so that they can survive if anything bad happens to the rest of them. But that aside, again, why Watani first? What, because he secured the deal with the other country to test the notebook? Uh, I guess I could see that being a thing, but I mean, the one pushing for it was Ryuzaki. Hell, honestly, I'm surprised she didn't go after Matsuda, since he was the one who suggested executing whoever was in possession of the notebook. But like I said, I'll talk more about that and the task force as a whole in a minute. Anyway, secondly, in regard to Rizaki, I love how you can really hear the concern in his voice when he calls out for Watari both times. The first time it's like a quiet kind of worry, like, hey, is everything okay? <laughs> Whereas the second instance, which happened after Watari wiped everything off their database, was more of a panicked call out. <laughs> I imagine that Rizaki could also see the screens changing, which made him all the more frantic to get some kind of response from Watari before the feed ultimately cut out. Because here's the thing, Rizaki had told Watari to make sure that he should erase all information in the event that something were to happen to him. Which is exactly what he did, with his dying breath, in fact. Which, I mean, I, I, I gotta give it to Watari. He gave it his all until the very end. But yeah, I imagine Rizaki told him to do that during that scene at the beginning of the episode. Now, as far as why he had him do that, well, we'll get into that in a later video. But for now, well, it's about that time. Everyone. The Shini got And yeah, this marks the end of Ryuzaki. Well, almost. The scene continues for a while. First, we get a shot of his spoon falling from the tips of his fingers, followed by a long shot of him slowly keeling over. And the goal of all of this is clear. To make you feel it. To let you soak in every last second of this man's final moments. It even invokes the theme of silence once again by way of cutting Domine Kida entirely. And as he falls, we can see light in the background, watching as his greatest adversary meets his end. And he actually does something kind of surprising. And I wanted to take note of what happened with the audio there, because from the moment light catches Ryuzaki, we switch to hearing things from Ryuzaki's perspective. Notice how the sound of light grunting is loud, like it's right in our ear, whereas Matsuda's voice is far away, given he's farther away from Ryuzaki. This is further supported by the fact that once Matsuda calls his name, we can hear the faint sound of the bell in the background again, ringing once, then twice, getting louder and faster until it ultimately becomes almost cacophonous. All the while, we're presented with a plethora of images, flashes of the same memories we saw earlier, interspersed among images of Rizaki staring up at light, of Rim somewhere in the building dying alone, and of light staring down at Rizaki. And I want to comment on all of it. Firstly, Rim, who... Damn, I, I actually really liked Rim. I appreciated her for staying true to who she was, flawed though she may have been. I also really liked the fact that she did not fuck with Light and she was not shy about it. It just sucks that she did all of this for Misa and you just know that Misa's just not gonna care at all. But fun fact, I guess, Misa's lifespan is now probably back to what it was before she made the deal with Ryuk, if not longer than what it was previously. Also, Interestingly enough, I imagine Ryuzaki's and Watari's lifespans have been added to hers too, which probably ain't much since Watari was pretty old and Ryuzaki had a shit diet, but still interesting to think that they kinda, sorta, but not really at all, live on through her. But anyway, in regard to light, I, mm, I, <laughs> I just, I, what an absolute piece of shit. Like, I hate it, but, <sighs> At the same time, I'm not gonna discount the fact that, aesthetically speaking, this moment goes pretty fucking hard. The way it keeps flipping between Ryuzaki, his memories, Rim, and then coming back to light, each time his face is slightly shifted, contorting itself into this sinister smile, letting Ryuzaki know in his final moments of life that he, without a shadow of a doubt, is Kira, and that he's won. 
he might as well just be saying, Well, looks like I win. And yeah, we're gonna talk more about light in a minute, but damn it, this shit was cool as hell, and I kinda hate myself for loving it so much. But yeah, lastly, let's talk about Ryuzaki, because there's actually a couple things that I wanna say about this. Firstly, no! <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, firstly, I like the fact that they brought back the scenes that we saw at the beginning of the episode. It kind of feels like it's meant to evoke the idea of his life passing before his eyes and his final moments, which I think is pretty cool. Furthermore, I like the fact that this entire scene is accented with a red glow that's emanating from all of those monitors. Given the fact that red is Kida's signature color, it feels fitting that the room would be pervaded by it. Or, I guess, more specifically, that Ryuzaki would be enveloped in it. And to take the light metaphor further, the first memory we're shown at the beginning of the episode is also the last one Ryuzaki sees before the camera transitions from the light to light. I thought that was beautifully executed, showing us that both his first memory and his last are of light. But yeah, with all of that said, thus ends the story of Ryuzaki. Sorry, I had to. But in all seriousness, that is the end for Ryuzaki. And honestly, the episode would have probably been fine ending right here. But nah, we still got a bit to get through. Starting with... Ah! We're gonna die! It'll be us next! And I, I hate him. I, I, I legitimately hate him. But I think what I hate more than him is the fact that in this scene, he's doing such a good job at selling this right now. Like, this is a Shakespeare-worthy performance right here. Because he knows they're fine, and it's just... <sighs> I hate it, but also, I would be remiss if I did not give credit where credit is due. So, fucking standing ovation for this piece of shit. I... Whatever, man. Anyway, his performance does what it's supposed to and scares the ever-loving shit out of all of them. And, I mean, why wouldn't it? Two of them just died. It would stand to reason that they would all die. Also, something that kind of bugged me was how quick both Watari and Ryuzaki died. Like, we saw Rim standing there, right? And then six seconds later, she's with Watari and he's already dying. Like, there's a 40 second delay from the point wherein you finish writing a person's name down to the point in which they die, right? And we can see that she doesn't even have her notebook out yet, meaning she hasn't even started writing yet. But six seconds later, Watari is already dying from a heart attack? And you can't even argue any sort of time jump because we see her, the lightning hits, the monitors immediately go red, and then we see that Watari is already dying. And then we see her frantically writing down Ryuzaki's name, and then within another six seconds, he's having a heart attack. It's like, why does her notebook act so much faster than any other notebook? But whatever, I'm not gonna harp on it. However, what I am gonna talk about real quick is what I mentioned earlier, with the way that the chief, Matsuda, Aizawa, and let's assume Mogi, since he doesn't like to fucking talk, were all adamant about not testing the notebook for whatever reason. While I found it to be dumb as hell, it's also what ultimately saved their lives. Because I imagine the only reason Rim didn't write their names down was because she figured that if they were left alive, they wouldn't go on to try and test the notebook in the future. So their weird, illogical stance on testing the notebook, which again, would have been an objectively beneficial thing to do for the sake of the investigation, was ultimately what saved their lives. Which I... <laughs> Okay, it's still silly as hell though. Anyway, Light, trying his best to earn that Oscar, continues his performance. Where are you, Shinigami? You know something about this, don't you? Come on out! He then proceeds to storm off in search of this god of death to do what exactly? But, uh, you know what? Actually, that's also pretty good acting on his part. Because, logically speaking, that's stupid. However, if you're in the moment and you're devastated at the loss of someone who was supposed to be your mentor and friend, then acting irrationally shouldn't be unexpected. So yeah, he's actually still killing it with the performance. Anyway, Light goes off and finds Rem's ashes and then loots it, thus taking ownership of her death note, which as we know from the rule in episode 24, will still work just fine even with her gone now. And yeah, now Light is back in possession of a death note, so cool. All obstacles have been cleared. From there, Light calls the rest of the task force and they huddle around the pile of sand that was once Rim, curious as to what the hell happened, which makes sense. They aren't familiar with Shinigami like that. Anyway, Light goes on to continue his little performance, claiming he'll avenge Rizaki and Watari and all the other people that have been killed because of Kira and everyone backs him. Though, Matsuda does end up saying, But 
aren't we all gonna get killed? And that's a fair thing to say. I mean, they don't even know what this pile of sand is. For all they know, this could have just been where Rim was going to take shits. Like, they have no concept of what's going on here. It's like, did the Shinigami kill Ryuzaki and Watari? Did Kira kill them? Is the Shinigami dead? Will it come back and kill the rest of us? Like, nobody knows. So I could see why Matsuda would be concerned. But Light ultimately brushes him off, saying, If you're afraid of dying, then leave the investigation. Which, okay, whatever. But I do like that Matsuda says that Light sounds like Ryuzaki in saying that. And personally, I would agree with that. And I think that's kind of Light's point in saying it. Setting himself up for, well, we'll talk about it next time. Anyway, we have now reached the final scene of this episode, wherein Light, having left the other members of the task force, is seen walking down a corridor. And if it looks familiar, well, that's because it is. It actually almost perfectly mirrors the scene from earlier in the episode where Light was on his way to see Ryuzaki, except now it's dark and he's headed in the opposite direction. And the message feels relatively clear, that the change from day to night after the death of Ryuzaki is meant to tell us that, in his absence, the world is set to become a much darker place as Light actively takes on the role of God. It is interesting, though, that the shot of Light basking in his victory is one wherein he's shrouded in darkness. I feel like, on top of it mirroring the scene from earlier, it also serves as a dark reflection of the end of episode 1, when Light proclaimed his desire of becoming God. I will become the God of this new world. The lighting in the scene gave it a much more positive feel, as if he really did intend on being a benevolent God that would make people's lives better. I even like the added touch of the sunlight shining through above his head, which could be a reference to the halo that you see around holy individuals in religious paintings. Now, juxtapose that with this scene, as he says, I am the god of the new world. It's accompanied by a flash of lightning and heavy rain. Not to mention the fact that he's sporting a sadistic smile and red, demonic looking eyes. It's like we've all together dropped the pretense of him thinking of himself as being a force of good. And you could even go further with the comparisons between episode 1 and now. Like the darker elements of the conversation between Ryuk and Light were accompanied by lightning and rain in that episode. But when Light goes on to say that he wants to be the god of the new world, we see him stare off at the sun rising on, presumably, the new world that he wants to create. But here, in episode 25, now that Light has actually gotten rid of everything and everyone that was in his way, the rain hasn't subsided at all. In fact, the weather seems downright abysmal, and where his eyes seemed kind and full of hope in that first episode, they're now blood red, and he has a much more sinister look about him. I just thought that was really interesting. But yeah, with all of that being said, whew, roll credits. Anyway, that's the end of this video, but before we wrap this one up, I wanted to go ahead and take a second to thank all of the folks over on our Patreon. First up, I want to say thank you to all four of our admirable assessors. I also want to say thanks to all 82 of our invaluable investigators. In addition to them, I wanted to give a special thanks to our five remarkable researchers. Arrow Falcon Green, Game and Alchemist, The Best, Trinity Schiffer, and Vanellian. And lastly, praise be to our six official overanalyzers. Cavarax XE, Seamart, Croy Raiden, I Am the Blonde Asshole, Joey Helbig, and Asia, who actually did the intro for this video. All of y'all are super awesome, and as always, I thank you all so much for signing up. It really does mean a lot. But yeah, if you liked this video, then consider dropping a like. If you really liked it, then consider subscribing. And if you just loved it and want to see more sooner, then consider joining the Patreon. Anyway, that's it for this time. Until next time, friends, peace. <laughs>